Hello, everybody. This is Vincent Horn, and I'm joined live today on Google Hangout with my good friend and um, awesome repeat guest at Buddhist Geeks, Diane Musho Hamilton. Hi, Great to have you here. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. Good morning. Good yeah, morning. it's good to see you. This is our first video interview together. It is, and and I was just praising Vince because because he's just initiated me into Google Hangout, and I feel that I've had the Buddhist Geeks download that I've done my geek practice for the morning, so I'm feeling really, really but, uh, progressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and you were you were, but that said, you were teaching koans this morning over Skype, weren't you? That's true, I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> this is like you know a cousin to that in some ways. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's right. That's interesting. Maybe we could start there. Uh, how long have you been doing the koans uh, work over Skype, and what, how are you finding that? Well, um, because I, I sort of matured as a, a teacher, and I received Dharma transmission at a time that I was extremely involved in the, in the integral world, which is where I met you. Um, many of my students came through the work of Ken Wilber and through integral, so they tend to be located all over the place. I have some students in Vancouver, Europe, South America. And the ones who are most committed to actually Zen practice and the lineage and really want that lineage transmission and really enjoy practicing at that level, I've been meeting with them over Skype every morning that we're both available, Monday through Friday now, for probably three years. Wow. So, yeah. So it's allowed me to work with a group of maybe a dozen students really rather closely, even though we're remote. So. Mm. And how do you, how do you find it um, using that medium? Like, does it does it work in terms of people presenting on the cons? And yeah. I mean, obviously it does if you're doing it for three years. But I'm yeah, curious think, what it's like. I think it does. I mean, one of the things that you know is probably just a huge part of your discourse is you know we're, we have these incredible supports of you know technology and all these different platforms and different ways that we can connect and. Yet, as human beings, you know, the subtlety of our energetic body and our sensitivities to each other when we're in person, there's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. And so there is a question, you know, particularly when uh, Zen training and, and Buddhist training generally is we really include the subtle domain and just the, the perception of, of the gross domain, the subtle domain, and the very subtle part of our experience. You know, there's a way that that energetic is, is cut out. Um, but I think the opportunity to build a relationship and to, to manifest the koan online, I feel like I get enough information um, that I can really work with it. So it's, it's been really an amazing gift for me to be able to continue teaching people who don't live here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the first time we're, we've been able to do that, right, in human history. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, it, there, there's some controversy within the Zen community, some some people have actually conducted ceremonies over Skype, like right. a ordination ceremonies, and those are those tend to be more controversial. People have more disagreements about that, you know, whether that can actually be done. But I think what happens for me is that I, I sort of say, you know, more Dharma is is better than less Dharma. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a Tibetan teacher that maybe a lot of your listeners are familiar with, and you may remember Kali Rinpoche. Oh yeah. Remember him? Sure. I mean, I don't personally yes. remember him, but <laughs> yeah, he has had quite a reputation. Well, when I was in Boulder years ago, and I was working at Naropa and studying Chogyam Trungpa's lineage, Kala Rinpoche came through, and I remember a, a Dharma talk he gave in which he explained that you know some Tibetan teachers were really rigorous with the preliminaries, and they really made sure that you know that everyone had done the basics before they started to give more sophisticated teachings, but he said, I'm like a blind man with an umbrella. <laughs> and wow. wherever I move and swing, you know, I deliver Dharma, and that's that's just how I do it. And that's kind of always stuck with me as a, you know, as an image for different ways it can be taught. Mm. Um, I wanted to show your book uh, here for those that are watching live. Um, this is uh, your latest, or your first book, right? Everything is yes, Workable. I, yeah, yeah, it's my first book. Yeah. yeah, congrats. Um, it seems like everyone I've talked to who's written a book says it's a huge undertaking, and it's also really rewarding when it's done. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it was a huge undertaking, and it took me a little bit of a, a period of time to figure out how to do it, you know, in the sense that I think, you know, writing is its own thing, and we all, every writer has their own sort of ritual for how they're able to 
to sit down and work. And I found uh, Tammy Simon actually sounds true uh, recommended that I just do a series of talks and then I transcribe them. And so what happened is that I set up a series of, you know, I think 24 talks, and I ended up with 22 chapters in the book. And I I basically rewrote the talks. There was still a lot of writing involved, but it did give me a structure and it gave me an immediate kind of layout for the book. And I think that was a huge part of it. And then finding the right editors to work with was another part of it. And I finally found those. And so it was about a three year process altogether. Mm, very cool. Actually, there's one other volume, Vince, and everybody, hold on for just a minute that I'll show you. You might be interested in because this volume just came out. Very interesting for anybody who's practicing in the Buddhist tradition at all. Have you seen this? This is called the Hidden Lamp, and this is uh, 25 years or 25 centuries of awakened women. So there mm. are 100 uh, women, contemporary women Buddhist teachers, who wrote commentaries on the stories of all the women in the lineages. Wow! So this is a really cool book. I have one chapter in this book, or one section, you might say. Oh, so nice! I'm just giving that a shout out. Yeah. Okay, so great. At exactly the same time. So. Great. Okay, and 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 uh, both of those are out of Shambhala, yeah, or maybe uh, this different. This one, this one is wisdom. Okay, great. Sh Shambhala, Shambhala and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> two good, two good uh, publishers. So, so this book, um, everything is workable. Um, it's a subtitle Zen, a Zen approach to conflict resolution, and. I think the last couple times we talked, I, I'm pretty sure we talked a bit about your background in Zen, um, but I but I don't think we ever talked about how you got into into the conflict mediation work. And I was I was wondering maybe if you could uh, fill fill us in on that piece of your history, how that happened. Well, I uh, in the introduction I talk a little bit about my history growing up, and and the the beauty of my upbringing is that I came from a really dynamic and very kind of vigorous and emotionally expressive family. And what that meant is that we just had a lot of, you know, we, we fought, you know, because uh, my family was not one that knew how to supplement emotion very well. So the upside to that is that everything was always on the table. You knew where you stood, you know, you sort of trusted people to come back around. And, um, you know, I, I often compare, I remember Keith Richard from the Rolling Stones, somebody asking, how is it that the Stones have managed to stay together all this time? And he said, because we always knew how to patch it up. Mm. And that's kind of, you know, what the real strength of my family was. But there was another side to it where um, that kind of emotional intensity was also wearing and painful. And uh, so I think I was always paying attention to how could I capture the authenticity and the care of my family. You know, there was a, a beauty in how engaged people were and a lot of truth. But the harmony factor wasn't as high. And so, you know, it's been kind of an inquiry of my whole life. And I, I think I've come to the conclusion that the harmony on this side of that includes conflict and includes discord and includes difficulty is a greater harmony than the one that doesn't. And so mm -hmm. that's really the, the argument that I make in the book is that we can we can come to more to deeper durability in the harmony when we when we really trust each other to know how to surface issues and how to work them out and then kind of let them go so that there's an efficiency to how we work with conflict. It's not always possible depending on our personality styles and the nature of what it is we're, we're conflicting about. But it's so I basically spent a lot of my years as a mediator and as a conflict resolution professional and just as a person in my personal relationships working on the skill set that really helps me to um, you know, feel to feel trusting in relationship to the challenges that come up in the relationship. So, mm. Mm. so w when you first started doing conflict work, did you like? How, how does it? How does one become a conflict mediator? I mean, is that a that that's a profession in itself, right? Like, there's an actual mm -hmm. degree or or like a training that you go through, and then and then you started working with like p civil disputes or how. How how did you? Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious. I've never I don't know no I know nothing about this. Well, interestingly enough, I I you know a lot of people who are in their 20s and 30s struggle over what they want to do with their lives or what their vocation is or what sure. their so-called calling may be. And I w I was just like a lot of 25 year olds and 29 year olds and 34 year olds and 
I had a certain amount of talent and had done many different things. I had a degree from Europa Institute in psychology and I'd worked as a clinician. I worked in the environmental movement. I had a degree in shiatsu massage. So I, you know, and I'd, I'd had, you know, different sorts of administrative jobs and I just didn't know what it was that I really wanted to do with myself and I was in a training program and we were talking about this traditional notion of calling and the way in, in traditional communities that people, people sort of told you what it was you did. And I had been asking, what do I want, what do I want? And couldn't really resolve that question. And so I switched it, I reframed it and started listening for what people told me I did well. And so mm. within like the next three weeks, there were three different occasions where I helped people sort out a dispute that they were having. And uh, one was in a big group that I was involved in this group was having this huge and I sort of helped straighten that out and someone came up to me afterwards and said you know you did that really well and it was really helpful and that happened three times and then I saw uh, an ad for a position at the Seattle Dispute Resolution Center so I applied for that position and I was hired and I did there I began with uh, they had a, a kind of dispute resolution over the phone program and I got trained how to listen and work over the phone and then I got trained in their mediation program mm. and then when I came back to the, to the state of Utah after living in Seattle there was a not, again it was kind of there were a lot of synchronicities around that the state was hiring a director for the new office of alternative dispute resolution in the judiciary and um, I didn't apply for it because at the time I was actually intending to move to San Francisco and then they, they actually asked me to apply and then they kind of pursued me and so I went to an interview and I had such a good experience and it seemed like a really nice opportunity so I stepped in as the director of that uh, of that first office of alternative dispute resolution that was back in 1994 and it was right at the beginning of the judiciary starting to work with mediation as one of its mm. methods mm. So, yeah so and, it had and a nice elegant unfolding to it in a way. yeah that's beautiful so there's this switch from you sort of trying to determine what your path would be to yeah. kind of stepping back and listening to what you were good at and kind of going with that. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah, mm. and I've done, to be honest, I mean, we have all these conversations about, you know, gender and whether it exists and what does it mean and all that business, but I my life has always flowed when I listen more than when I try to assert my way. I, I, I've never been able to really get any traction but when I when I position myself in, in more of a listening mode and receiving mode things seem to unfold more fluidly for me. Mm. And, struggle, and do you I've always struggled with the other thing. It doesn't work very well. Mm. And do, do you find because you're sort of implying that for some people maybe it does work better that way? Mm -hmm. I um I'm assuming so. I mean, I know I, there's so much material out there on finding your purpose and setting goals and how to accomplish oh, your I know. goals and you know, setting your intention and the secret. You know, right, but right. For me, that's that hasn't been the method that's worked so well. I huh. understand the importance of intention, however. Intention, I understand. I actually have a chapter on that in the book. So. Hmm. Cool. So yeah, t turning toward the book a bit, um, I wanted to start by asking a question which is are contemplatives naturally conflict averse because this is something I hear uh, quite a bit and I I can I can draw from my own experience and several of my friends who are contemplatives and I could say maybe there's some truth to this um, <laughs> it, it, what's your experience because uh, you know that I think that's a common kind of um, observation in contemplative communities that many contemplatives are kind of averse to certain kinds of conflict well I mean, I like to, to place this whole inquiry within, you know, the context of evolution because we're working with an evolutionary framework and as human beings, we're growing, we're changing, the cosmos is growing, we're changing, we know that. And there are probably f four or five really hugely intractable, intractable problems on the planet. So, you know, economic justice and poverty, um, you know, climate change, uh, you know, just what you know, just generally uh, the arms trade and, and racial and ethnic strife has to be in the top four or five. Um, if you look at the really big problems that we work with around the globe, you know, and I think that we, because of our, you know, our background as maybe predators and as, as warring tribes with one another, that, you know, it's in the hard drive to, 
to fight. We have a fighting nature. We have a withdrawing nature. We have a freezing nature. We have a you know a really sophisticated nervous system in terms of these questions. And so a lot of us are, you know, we have there are generally sort of three different styles that people participate in. And interestingly enough, those three styles correspond precisely to the three poisons in Buddhism. Yeah, so, that, I found that really interesting reading about the kind of connection between those two models and, and, and presumably they were developed independently. Yeah, that's what's interesting is that they, they, you know, that I just saw that they were the same, you know, because uh, the research in the conflict area says that we're basically avoidant, uh, which is, you know, to turn away, and we would call that ignorance in the Buddhist school, right? And in the Buddhist school we talk about passion or grasping, I think is a better word than passion, clinging and accommodating where you're, you're just really focused on the other and you won't sort of let go of the relationship. You're sort of codependent in a certain way. And then the aggressive style, the competitive style, the confrontive style. So in, the, in Buddhism it's passion, aggression, and ignorance or, or uh, greed, anger, and ignorance is another one that's spoken about. And in the conflict resolution school it's spoken about as avoidance. Over, it's really over accommodation and aggression, those three. So... Mm. Within the contemplative context, I think that, you know, meditation practice begins kind of with a renunciation, you know, in the sense that we say, you know, thoughts arise and I'm not my thoughts, you know, sensations arise and, and I let those go. So there's this kind of differentiation from whatever arises. So I think in a certain way that renunciate um, capacity maybe does kind of correspond to a avo more avoidant nature. I was, at a, I was at this Hidden Lamp event in San Francisco recently, and there's a Zen teacher there, Grace Sharsh, and, and, and she said to me, you know, very spontaneously, she said, man, you know, within these communities, we really need these skills because we all are avoidant. She said that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my experience is we all need to learn, and we're all growing on that cutting edge, and we have different styles and different challenges. I haven't been in any communities that, that do that better, than other communities unless they have deliberately decided to practice it, whether yeah. it's a, a spiritual community or whether it's a, whatever it happens to be. So one yeah. of the best people that does the best work in this area is Arnie Mandel. His community is really good at it because they practice it so much. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I was uh, kind of reflecting back on on practicing with you and your community, and it was interesting. It was such a contrast to some of the other communities I'd practiced in because we weren't just doing first person meditative practice we were also having a lot of discussion and you were bringing in some of those practices um, and I found that really interesting because I think there's sometimes an assumption like if I do my meditative work in solitude that that, that will automatically somehow translate into um, my interpersonal engagements and relationships and I didn't find that to be true. Um. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> Neither did I. That was the whole thing, is that I just didn't find that to be true. And uh, and you would think with all of the, the relinquishment of egoic attachment and of ego identity that we would be better at it. But I think the issue is that when, when the sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated, gets threatened, whether it's just a, an insult or a territorial problem, you know, happens a lot in Zen centers where people fight over, you know, who's, you know, setting up the Zendo or taking care of the altar or whatever, all kinds of little disputes. Mm. And when that cyst, that nervous, when that, those, that biochemistry and those, that stimulation happens in our nervous system, we all do what we do, you know, and spiritual communities are notorious for being passive aggressive because everybody looks like they're so harm harmonious on the surface and underneath there's still a lot of, you know, that kind of primate-like activity going on. So yeah. I, I like that you're mentioning kind of it, like in the Zendo or on a retreat. It's Isn't it funny how those things come out in such ludicrous ways because the <laughs> container is so small and there's so many, there's so few things we could like, you know, uh, grab yeah. onto and yet we do yeah. and it becomes so oh obvious. Gosh. Oh, it's just amazing. Everything is so exaggerated, you know. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm just of the mind that, that, you know, in the same way that, that, you know, mindfulness awareness will allow us to, you know, work with a medical problem with more consciousness and more depth, 
you know, we wouldn't not seek medical help or a healing methodology if we had an illness. Why do we imagine that we're going to be able to, to know how to do this when we've never been trained or taught? Mm. And so it, it isn't sufficient, it's a, but it is an essential basis for doing this kind of work. In other words, that's why I brought the two together, is that I think mindfulness practice and Zen practice does so much in the way of letting us see our patterns and letting us see the ways in which we hold and cling and what we're so familiar with the sensational components in the body that we actually can work in, at a more pro, in a, at a more profound level in a way if we if we learn these skills with the basis of a meditative practice. So, right. So so it's not sufficient, but it but it can enhance deeply that that kind of. Um, Yes, absolutely. Work. The two together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and th and that ties into the you know we've talked about this before, but the the different perspectives that that we can take, the kind of primordial perspectives. So it sounds like again, how how do we, um, in some sense, learn how to operate in the appropriate spaces, mm -hmm. um, in the appropriate perspectives, and then how do we bring those together? Really yeah. interesting. Well, there are three that are that are most important in a, in a conflict context and interestingly enough they're the three that are most important to language as we all know from, from the work we've done with integral theory so the first is the perspective of I you know what is it that I Diana yes, think feel what do I want what do I need you know that's a very powerful perspective the, the aggressive style person is generally very good at asserting their I mm. that's what they do best right Yes. Exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's the strength. You know, that's the strength of that particular style is that there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of dynamism, you can stand up for yourself, you can speak your truth. And people people trust you to, to show up. You know, there's a certain respect that comes with having a powerful eye, and you can all, often lead very well. Now the second perspective that's important is the perspective of you. And you really comes not from asserting, but from listening. I can only really understand your perspective then if I'm willing to listen to you, take into account your wants and needs, your desires, what it is that would be a great outcome to you. But in order to do that, I have to relinquish the I. Right? I as long as I'm holding on to the I, I can't really receive you. So people who tend to be really good at this are more accommodating styles. And they're, you know, there's a deep habit to sort of take care of the other. A lot of I don't know if younger women, but certainly women in my generation and the generation ahead of me, they would often find themselves being better at listening and better at accommodating. You know, because somehow, you know, it's more comfortable for me to actually take care of your wants and needs than to address my own. That's actually very threatening. Mm. Yeah, you know, so, and then the third perspective really corresponds to more the avoidant, but it, but in the it's called the enlightened aspect of avoidance. Avoidance is simply a neutral, spacious awareness. So you don't shut down, but you don't get involved. You just, you're able to stay present. So the witnessing, third-person perspective, that simply remains present, which we really cultivate a lot in meditation, um, just to stay present to the sensations of conflict, to stay present to maybe what's happening in an interaction or in a group of people, and uh, be able not to either get pulled into the conflict or, conflict or pushed out of it, but just that, that simple neutrality, that's the strength of the avoidant personality when they actually stabilize awareness and learn to bring presence to it instead of subtly shutting down. Mm -hmm. So those three styles correspond to those three perspectives. And for someone to be skillful, they have to know how to move between all three. It's not that anybody's wrong in their style, it's just generally that we tend to adhere to one because that's what we're used to. So what, what I generally do is encourage people who are really assertive first person to practice listening skills and practice neutrality. People who are really accommodating to practice actually bringing up their wants and needs and expressing them and feeling the sensations of aggression and care and intensity in the body. And then, uh, and then also to uh, to practice neutrality as well. And then for the person who has a, the style of being slightly avoidant, to really feel the spaciousness and the strength of that, but be willing to actually lean in and listen to the other at times, and also to bring their own personal uh, wants and needs into the space. So it's a matter of expanding what we do 
not that what we do is wrong, it's just simply limited, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does make sense. I'm curious, in terms of practical training in this sort of thing, how, what does it actually look like to, to, to train in this way as you're communicating with someone? Like, how does that work? Um, you mean in, a, in like a formal training context where I'm teaching or if you were just to practice on your own? So can I give you some practice tips perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was interested kind of in both, but whatever you think is most relevant, yeah. Okay. All right, both. So um, uh, basically, um, you know, if we, if we do a first, second, and third person exercise, so imagine for a moment that we're in a group of three and you're the, so, so let, let's do it this way. You be in the first person and I'll be in the second person. And let's okay. imagine for a moment that, um, uh, that there's something that you really want from me that I haven't delivered to you. So let's just, can you make up some sort of scenario? Let's imagine that you're wanting me to, uh, what would it be? Yeah, no, um, yeah, I really, I really wanted you to uh, give a more profound answer to my questions. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. So what happens? He see. He, so what happens? He says he wants something more from me, and my first response, of course, is to contract. Right? Maybe my heart starts to pound, or I feel my neck's a little bit flushed, or suddenly there's a butterfly, or a feeling of nausea, or my solar plexus contract. So I have to live with all of that. That's not going away. And this is the thing. This is in our evolutionary hard drive. Every every experience we have passes through the amygdala first. So this idea. The only way we're not going to have those feelings is if we don't engage. If we actually let ourselves feel and relate, those feelings are going to come up. So I have to notice that as the person who's going to practice listening skills. Vince just asserted his wants and needs. So I have to let all that go by and then come back, feel it, know that it's okay, and then basically say to you, so it sounds like, you know, in the interest of Buddhist geeks and this podcast, that what you're really hoping for is something really profound and dynamic that are, that's going to excite your audience and wake people up. And mm. You somehow want me to deliver a little bit more of that than I am right now. You know, and then if I go one bit further, I might say, and is there, do you have an idea about how I might do that? Well, I think, uh, I think we're doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you just practice being in the first person and really saying what's true for you. And I practice just now being the second person by using my listening skills. And we can imagine that maybe there was someone practicing just staying available to the conflict and noticing what their response was, whether they felt protective of me or whether they wanted to side with you, and just simply remaining neutral. Mm. If you're a mediator, if you're a judge, if you're ever performing as a neutral, you have to have a really powerful capacity to be present without, you know, wobbling. Yes. So yes. that would be an example of how to practice. And then if you and I were going to work more together, we might even do some exercises together where you practice raising your aggression, letting yourself really feel it and getting mad and speaking from there. Because the beautiful thing about aggression is that when you're mad and you really say what you really have on your mind, it's usually very clear, right? It's like, sure. I'm really pissed because blah, blah, blah. And there's no ambiguity and there's no confusion. So the transmutation of aggression is clarity, as we know, and power. So if we were in a workshop together, we might actually practice you really like getting really mad at me. Interesting. So, so in a safe environment, you would actually mm -hmm. kind of intensify some of those things and, yep. and kind of work with them. That, that seems really useful to actually be able to, because I can see in the meditative kind of first person subjective mm -hmm. training, um, that's not as common. Like we don't try to like amplify necessarily <laughs> anger. Maybe <laughs> no. in some, maybe in some tantric approaches that that might yeah. be true. I don't know. Yeah. But. I think it, I think if we were to locate these kinds of practices, if they if they did have a place, you know, I would think in in uh, the Kagyu school, the tantric schools, you you would find this more. Because I actually learned about the transmutation of emotion from Chogyal Trungpa. Right. That was right. Really that's really where I learned about it to begin with. So that sense that you capture the energy of the emotion but you liberate somehow the attachment and you use the energy and that's where the power and the clarity comes from. And over time we do, we just get better at it. There's no mm -hmm. question. Interesting. And so, and, and it seems like there's something really useful about kind of getting familiar with those different perspectives um, and, and doing the ones that are difficult too. It sounds like. Yeah, 
Yeah, precisely. Mm. Like for myself, I'm such a basic hothead. You know, I, mean, I have a Scottish Irish background. I mean, I'm just basically a, I burn hot. You know, mm -hmm. so my first response always is a fiery one. And so, you know, for me to practice neutrality, you know, and meditation is practicing neutrality at some level. And then also to practice really, you know, letting that, you know, turning the heat down to to a level of warmth. That heat is actually beneficial when it's warm. It has to be the right temperature. And then mm -hmm. when I, the temperature's right, then I can really listen with a lot of empathy and a quality that other people can really feel heard. So... All three Interesting. Are really essential. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I I did have a question too about something you wrote um, somewhere somewhere in the middle of the book, and you you started talking about your relationship with with your own teacher, with Genpo mm -hmm. Roshi, mm -hmm. and uh, one I found it to be really quite vulnerable. I mean, in terms of the level of of detail that you were sharing, mm -hmm. um, and and sort of uncommon in in that sense. Um, and but it also brought up a question for me, which was, sure, sure. Um, you know, you spoke you spoke basically about this process that you've gone through in relationship to mm -hmm. to um, your teacher and um, the way that it sounded almost like I, I'd imagine like a an amazing marriage and then an amazing divorce. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, like you were describing, you know, really, really the, this growing, deep, deepening sense of intimacy and almost like sharing one mind. And then at some point, like things started shifting, and, and there was disagreement more. And then suddenly, it was like you didn't agree on almost anything, and there was this That's kind right. of very big, uh, widened gap between you. Um, and 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 you actually said at the very end that um, that it's now it's been several several years since you've seen each other. I don't know if that's still true, but um, yeah, so true. so that, so it's almost been three years. Okay. Okay. So. I wonder if you could say a bit about that, and and you know, because yeah. it, it doesn't line up, I guess, with some sort of certain ideals about how maybe how the teacher-student relationship should be, and yet so many people have this experience that have been around the block and have worked with people, you know, where there's some way in which they fall in love and then they fall out of love and then they really can't see eye to eye anymore, and it's just mm -hmm. it's true. Well, let, me, let, let me speak about it from maybe just. Three three or four perspectives kind of quickly. And the first perspective, I'm just going to speak about it from the perspective of Dharma. Which, mm -hmm. And when I say Dharma, I mean, uh, I mean some sort of either ultimate truth, but maybe even karma, in the sense that I, I've been a student of Buddha Dharma since I was you know, in my very early 20s. And there, the, the, there's a certain way, and I, I don't know how this will sound to your listeners, but there's a certain way that Dharma has its own agenda. And I feel to some degree that I met Genpo Roshi at precisely the right time in my life. He, he, you know, he transmitted to me the most important. Oh, I mean, he was fundamentally my meditation teacher, my Zen teacher. He taught me the big mind process, and for the the ten or twelve years that we were really involved with one another, you know, it was just a massively creative and very meaningful relationship. And then. I literally, at the moment I received Dharma transmission, it was almost like it was complete. So there's a karma to it that is unexplainable to me. Let me just put it that way. Um, and I feel a little bit like, you know, I'm a, I'm a servant of this school, and I don't really necessarily get to decide the way things go. So that's one thing. I would prefer Shogun Trunka hadn't died, too, you know, because he was my first teacher, and then he died, and it was a period of being kind of in the wilderness, and this, you know, there's if this whole school is about learning how to receive what life is offering, and 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 then to be able to take the next steps when things change, and to trust those changes. So that would be the biggest framework. Um, there's another framework, which is that the master-disciple relationship in these Asian traditions is very particular. And my teacher was schooled by an Asian teacher, and he was very surrendered and very sublimated to that teacher. Mm. I And my teacher was caught sort of in the crosshairs of culture around that, because in terms of transmission, you know, most of us understand there's a hierarchy. In terms of how an organization is run, how we interact as friends, how we work on projects together, all of us, from a developmental point of view, have been our first person perspective has been given a lot of weight. 
So for us to be in the West, to continually be in that sort of sublimated relationship is not comfortable. And sometimes in my own experience, sometimes it, it even has yeah. a tendency to, I would say for those of us who need to pick up a stronger sense of I identification, it can be weakening. For others of us, it's very good practice and surrender because we mm. surrender to our, to our life. So in a certain way, we got caught in the cultural crosshairs of that. You know, in the sense that because he had an Asian teacher, his expectation of me was very particular. And I really betrayed slash offended him by not staying precisely in that submitted posture. And from his perspective and the way he was trained, I violated our contract. So that's one perspective on that as well. And, mm. and he's right from that point of view. From another point of view... Um, Anytime there's a mentor in the relationship, there's a moment where we, a person has to step into their own power. So from a developmental point of view, we identify stronger than we disidentify in order to keep growing. And when you become empowered, that how a teacher holds a student in the next stage of their relationship um, is, a, is a tricky art. And some people do that a little bit better than others. And then we have a personal style. I'm a highly related person which means I stay in relationship, but there's a lot of conflict because I stay in relationship. And I think Roshi's own style is when it, it isn't working, he doesn't, he doesn't need to be bothered with it. He has other fish to fry. So it you know, just totally depends on where, how we want to talk about it. And you know, there's no question that I certainly made errors in judgment and errors in, in our relationship. And um, you know, that's really my responsibility to look at that. And, uh, but I also have learned to sort of trust how it's going. I don't really feel that I can make a gesture to repair it. I've kind of tried that and it hasn't really worked. So my, my deepest loyalty is to um, this greatest perspective that I talked about first. So, yeah, no, it, it, it sounds like you've really uh, reflected and considered considered this quite a bit. I mean, otherwise, I don't think you'd be able to uh, talk about it from so many perspectives here. Um, I really yeah, love no, my I'm just... teacher. You know, I really love my teacher. And I also, um, you know, for whatever reason, I just couldn't live with the conditions at a certain point. And and you know, for me, going back to the to the notion of conflict resolution, that that kind of brings up this recognition that the outcome of working with conflict isn't always that the conflict is sort of resolved in some way where everyone's happy and everyone's still in relationship. Like it, no. it, it doesn't mean that, that it could, there could be many different kinds of outcomes. Yeah, yeah, precisely, precisely. Um, when I say everything is workable, that's actually a quote from Chogyam Trungpa. He says, whatever arises in the confused mind is regarded as the path. Everything is workable. It's a fearless proclamation of the lion drawer. Well, some things change. Some things end. Our life ends. Mm. Nothing is permanent. So mm. even though we may have skills and we may have a value of remaining in relationship, sometimes the situation is such that that's not possible. And then can we also include that in our experience so that there's a greater sense of resolution even though the more relative resolution doesn't meet our needs or our expectations, can we still find a way to be at peace with things that don't match with our preferences? Mm. It's certainly not my preference that we're not in contact. Yeah, so so everything is workable doesn't mean everything works out the way the way you want it to. You want it to, absolutely. No, if everything is done, <laughs> I wanted it to. <laughs> Let's face it. You know, Probably be pretty it, it, boring. <laughs> well, we'd all be living in some idealized version of like, some storybook, you know. Mm. But that's what's so great. Reality is rigorous in, the, in our practice. Buddhist practice is really what I love about it so much is that it has that kind of ruthless or rigorous quality of putting putting us directly in touch with what is. And, you know, impermanence, as we know, is one of the three marks of existence to our life, to relationships. Lots of things change. And, you know, how to gracefully let go without blaming the other, making them, you know. It's not that I haven't 
you know, certainly blame my teacher at moments during this process, but at the same time, I know he's not to blame per se. That's just a that's just a momentary way of dealing with the unhappy feelings. Mm. So. Great, great, thank you. And and I should have mentioned at the beginning the uh, the the Dharma name that you received, which <laughs> is what, what it, doesn't it translate as literally no no conflict? Interesting. No conflict, no struggle. No struggle. Okay, no conflict. So yeah, interesting. So so you you've sort of been in this process of living living. I imagine living into into that. Yeah, I mean it's my life. It's a life koan for me. You know, mm. it's just a theme that I work with in my particular life. And uh, so I'm I'm happy to be able to make some progress and to teach about it. And I also feel greatly humbled by it because you know we talk in the in the more evolutionary school. That the, the quality of being itself beyond conditions is one of peace, that there's a uh, pristine quality to awareness and unconditioned quality to awareness. But on the evolutionary side of the street, where time is included and we're growing and we're changing and things are moving, that's a much more turbulent experience. You know, peace does not exist in the becoming side of the street. Birth is traumatic, death is traumatic, all those changes are traumatic. So we can touch the space that pervades, if you will, all of experience in which, um, you know, our deepest nature is free of that struggle. But to be a human being is to participate in that struggle, which is why Mahayana Buddhism is more about engaging in it as opposed to renouncing it. Yeah. And... Um, you know, so the great vehicle is that step towards, as Nagarjuna said, samsara is nirvana. You know, that we find the peace within the struggle. We don't expect the struggle not to be there, but we do have our practice. So we have moments where we can, we can certainly experience the emptiness and the perfection of our life, even though it hurts. Thank goodness. Cool. Thank you so much, Diane. It's um, it's awesome to speak with you again, and and thanks for taking the time out of your morning to uh, to join the Buddhist Geeks. Yeah, totally. My pleasure. It's always great to talk to you, Vince, and I really appreciate your questions. It's a great conversation. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.